Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Dera. Today, our guest is veteran mining analyst and commodities expert, Mickey Falk. A certified professional geologist, Mickey has seen nearly every type of rock type on the planet and has experience in exploration and evaluation of commodities in diverse geological environments. He has worked for major mining companies and junior explorers as a consulting geologist for over 20 years. His website is mercenarygeologist.com, and we are delighted to have him here today as our guest. Good day, Mickey, and welcome to SBTV. Uh, thanks a lot, Patrick. It's my pleasure. Uh, we're, we're happy to have you here. Um, you know, just last week, uh, I was over in uh, Vegas, and we, we had a trip to the, the Grand Canyon, and I saw all the geological formations, and um, I'm, I'm happy that you're here. You're our first geologist to, to come on the show, so I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled that, that you were able oh, to I'm make honored. it. Could you share with us a little bit about your background, and how did you choose the name Mercenary Geologist? Uh, well, uh, I've been a geologist for uh, nigh on 40 years now, um, mainly as, uh, well, as an economic geologist, I would emphasize the word economic. So uh, searching for base metals, precious metals, even oil and gas, water, uranium, I've done about everything in 31 different countries. Uh, so a mercenary, someone for hire and I've been a geologist for hire for the majority of my career. I spent about six years early on with a major mining company, but I haven't really had a, a, a regular paycheck since then. So all geologists are mercenary. I'm just the one that picked the title and, uh, and trademarked it. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Uh, I guess that fits in with the uh, University of New Mexico, Lobos, the, the lone wolf, just doing your own thing. <laughs> well, you know your American spectator sports. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a Lobo fan and, and uh, as an alum of that uh, fine university. And I still spend uh, most of my time on a farm south of, uh, south of Albuquerque uh, and not that far from University of New Mexico. Uh, Mickey, do do you specialize in any specific type of metal, like uh, certain metals, like precious metals, or is it just a, a broad field? Uh, it's pretty much a broad field. Uh, I'm a generalist. I know a little bit about a lot. I'm probably not really an expert in too, too many things, but uh, 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 my focus, uh, really, because the markets for most of my career have been on copper and gold. Uh, uranium, some of the uh, more used and more important uh, metals to the well-being of the planet. With uh, gold and silver, there are several different types of ratios between these two metals. Um, there's the price ratio, uh, the production ratio, and the crustal sure. abundance ratio. Uh, uh, you're well-versed. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But... <laughs> Thanks, Mickey. But getting to the crustal abundance ratio, um, in your opinion, how much gold and silver exist in the Earth's crust? Well, if you look at the numbers compiled by organizations such as the USGS and others, um, the gold to silver ratio in the crust is something on the order of uh, 16 to 1. Mm. Um, so you see some numbers as low as 12 to 1, 12 to 1, 16 to 1. Uh, but that does not imply that they are extracted at that ratio, or, or that has a lot to do with economics, the prices. Uh, historically, the price ratio of gold to silver uh, is probably going to average, we've done the distributions, uh, and I've published on that, something on the order of maybe 50 to 1, um, the price ratio right now of gold and silver, and I calculated it last night. It may have changed this morning, but probably not much, is uh, 79 to 1. So right. it's been in that plus or minus 80 to 1 ratio for quite some time now, and that's anomalous, uh, not, <laughs> pardon me, anomalous. And uh, uh, I can't really remember the distribution, something on the order of about uh, – 7% of the time uh, is the gold-silver ratio that high. It has been as high as 
94 at one time recently, yes. but uh, that ratio is a little out of whack right now. Okay, so how's the ordinary? Okay, so by your numbers, you you're looking at the ratio to be somewhere more around 50, 50 to one or something, somewhere around there. Yeah, yeah. So my strategy, I think gold is money, the only real money. So when the gold silver ratio is skewed to the upside, then that would be a buy signal for silver. Right. But I would always say that uh, gold is real money. So when the ratio would normalize, then you sell your silver and turn it into real money. Yeah, I hear you. Totally agree with that. Um, we sometimes we hear reports where where the miners are saying that it, it's uh, gold silver. They're coming out of the ground at a, a one to nine ratio. It, it's no, that's about right. Yeah, that's about right. Okay. Yeah, from our calculations and what we do is we track world production. We track world production. I think now our database goes back to 1996, and we're working on getting data. Further back then, it becomes a little bit more problematic. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, recently, uh, if memory serves, and I'm pulling this out of the memory banks, but I think you're correct at uh, at uh, uh, one part gold to nine parts silver. I do like what you said about the fifty to one, but I, I got to ask, why do you think there's this disparity between the the gold and silver? Uh, I mean, in terms of the ratio right now at eighty to one. Well, silver is mainly industrial mineral. So as industrial economies go up and down world economy, that ratio is going to change. Uh, we've had over the past few years some geopolitical turmoil, and that would generally mean that gold's going to go up more because uh, it is a safe haven. Uh, that's a great question. I don't have real answers. I can speculate on a on a couple of answers. Uh, you know, there are very few uh, primary silver mines in the world. Most mines that produce silver are lead and zinc mines, some mm. copper mines, some gold mines. But but silver is a byproduct of mining, whereas gold is is really the metal that is sought after for the most part, unless you're operating in a lead zinc mine. Um, but that's a great question. All I can do is speculate on a couple of answers. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll touch on the, um, the, the primary and, and secondary miners in a bit. But um, when it comes to, let's say, the, the finished product, the, the finished bullion product, mm -hmm. all, all we see is a nice shiny coin. And, and I don't think we appreciate what the, the miners actually go through. Um, you having knowledge on that, and what would you say are, are the top three challenges that gold miners have? Uh, costs are the is the top challenge, and that has two major inputs: energy inputs and labor inputs. So the real challenge for gold miners is is margin, producing gold at a low enough price that they can cover. Uh, all the cost inputs, the hard cost inputs, plus you have depreciation, amortization, you have the cost of capital, uh, you have uh, dividends if you're a good coal company. So you add all that together and, and mining is a really tough business. I tell you the truth, Patrick, I'm an explorer. I don't want to be a miner. <laughs> and in my newsletter, uh, you will notice that I cover explorers, sometimes developers. I own 35 or 40, around 40 mining stocks or exploration mining stock. Only, only a handful of those are miners, and and generally those miners I've inherited through takeovers or acquisitions or companies that have started as explorers and become miners. So uh, it's a really tough business. I don't know if I really want to be in the mining business. Uh, from exploration and, and the realization that there is a substantial deposit to go after, uh, what's the time frame from uh, initial discovery to actually producing and, and getting gold out of the ground? No, generally a minimum of five years, and uh, and that can go to five to ten to fifteen years, depending on how good the deposit is, uh, the cost of capital, whether capital is available to build a mine and. Finally, uh, more and more we're faced with uh, uh, opposition and regulations and 
what I call resource nationalism, governments trying to change the rules. Yeah. So it, it really has lengthened the process considerably uh, just uh, over the last half of my career. Um, and that's really why I'm increasingly kind of pulling in my, uh, my horns a bit and, and focusing on what I consider safe geopolitical jurisdictions where the rule of law is followed, governments are stable, stable, mineral tenure is secure. So for now, for me, that's mainly uh, uh, specific countries in the Americas. So uh, the U.S. in particular, because of uh, lessening of bu bureaucracies and regulations and a, and a can-do uh, executive administration versus a can't-do that we had for eight years uh, before Trump was elected, uh, specific parts of Canada, specific parts of Mexico, of course, Chile, uh, which is uh, where the rule of law is followed, not always happens in, uh, in Latin America, but uh, certainly in Chile, there is a strong rule of law. Although I have to say, uh, after living there for a while, it's the most litigious society I have ever lived in. And then specific parts of Peru. So, so those are the countries in the Americas that really interest me at this juncture. And notice I said specific parts of Canada, too. Uh, I'm sitting right now in my... Uh, in my other office in Vancouver, British Columbia, and, and I wouldn't touch British Columbia right now as a destination for exploration. Oh, good. Can I ask why not? Uh, yeah, uh, a socialist government, uh, uh, can, ongoing native land issues, uh, uh, a very strong and, and vocal uh, environmental not in my backyard community here in the lower mainland and in Victoria. Um, uh, taxation regime, there's a whole litany of problems here in British Columbia. Recently, we had a guest on uh, SBTV, and um, he pointed um, out that, that there were no uh, major huge mine discoveries in the last 15 years. And by huge, um, I'm referring to mines that, that have produced 10 million ounces of, of gold or so. Um, mm -hmm. Most of the discoveries now seem to be well under five million ounces. Uh, is it true from is this true from your experience where we are seeing smaller uh, production from from gold mine or smaller deposits from gold mines? Uh, overall, I would say yes. Uh, uh, the easy giant deposits, the ones that outcrop, uh, I think for the most part have been found uh, in most parts of the world. Uh, that does not mean that we're not going to continue to find giant deposits, but they're likely to be uh, buried under cover. So it takes more detective work, geological sleuthing, if you will. Um, right. You know, there was, there have been some, a couple of giant deposits found in the previous boom, but uh, one of those, the, the best discovery still sits undeveloped because of resource nationalism, and that's Fruta del Norte in Ecuador with 15 million ounces. Uh, about 14 million of that is in gold and a, and a million equivalent in silver. But uh, that deposit is, is, was discovered in 2004 and 14 years later hadn't produced an ounce of gold simply because of resource nationalism. Uh, in Ecuador, uh, that's changing now. We'll see. Uh, my question is, what happens after the next Ecuadorian election, which is in four or five years, I think a six-year term, are, are they going to elect another socialist? We'll see. Yeah, um, I, if, if I recall, I think this is in the news maybe about four or five years ago. I think they were ready to, to actually start, but then the government stepped in with some environmental rules. Well... Yeah, it's basically some sort of environmental reason to stop the mine, but it's really extortion. Uh, uh, they want a bigger piece of pie, and they were able to negotiate that with Lundin Gold and and get a significant portion of the mine. The deal that that Lundin and uh, and I think they put it into a subsidiary com company. I don't think it's exactly Lundin Gold, uh, but. Uh, I looked at the deal they did with the Ecuadorian government, and they essentially gave 50% of the deposit away for, for
for not for very little. So, uh, but it's rich enough; it can probably carry that. It, it's a, it was a fantastic discovery. Yeah, I know. Uh, I think we're both familiar with a country who kind of gave away their uranium, also. So, um, <laughs> I guess I guess we're in good company uh, there. Uh, Oh, well, I'm not sure which country you're referring to, but I can speculate that is uh, the uranium deal, one deal with uh, the Clintons and uh, and the Russians, where the U.S. gave up 25 percent of its, or the U.S. didn't, but uh, the, a company, Uranium One, was sold to the Russians, and it produced, uh, and still produces, a significant amount of uh, U.S. uranium in Wyoming, so... Uh, uh, Probably shouldn't get me started on that uh, <laughs> bit of geopolitical intrigue of which two major mining executives uh, in Canada profited uh, immensely on that and just happened to uh, contribute millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation. Mm. Oh, boy. It's Grant Williams who's saying things that make you want to go, hmm. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I'm I'm with you, Mickey. I, I think I'll uh, I'll avoid diving in too deep on that one. Also, um, a bit of a tough question. Um, how would you define peak gold? Uh, ridiculous idea. <laughs> um, <laughs> number one, let me let me uh, explain my remarks. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of news. Lately, I think it's fake news about uh, about peak gold and the idea that uh, as of 2017, we will never see gold production as high again. Um, I don't quite buy in on that. Uh, Ian Telfer is the one that first uh, uh, made the news a month or six weeks ago about this saying, as you had uh referred to previously about all the good gold deposits, giant deposits have been found. Well, maybe for a, a giant failing gold company like Gold Corp, who hasn't really rewarded its shareholders historically, it becomes uh, more and more problematic to uh, to follow what uh, they, their corporate philosophy of growth for growth's sake. Uh, in my mind, uh, mining is value industry. It should be about margin, not about growing the number of reserves and resources and produced ounces. And the majors haven't been able to keep up with their lofty goals of producing more gold year after year. In fact, the majors are on a, on the whole producing probably half the amount of gold they did uh, 10 years ago. Um, so. For them, maybe it is peak gold, but all in all, uh, you know, there's every reason to think that uh, that gold exploration will continue and production will continue. Um, in the short term, we probably have reached a peak, but I think that's temporary. And the reason we will have reached a peak in 2017 and, and pundits, uh, myself included, were looking uh, three or four years ago and said we are probably reaching a, a, a peak in production. Uh, that's because we've had five to six years of a bear market and exploration dollars in the ground are, are about a third of what they were in 2011. And, and that's up considerably from what they were in, in 2016, for example. Uh, so you'll see this lag time, which we've already talked about, of five to seven to 10 to even 15 years before a discovery is actually pouring Doré. Um, so I would look for a temporary decline, but, uh, but the world's awash in gold, the world's awash in all resources. Uh, we have plenty of everything. It just been, it depends on the economics of extracting uh, uh, the metals out of the ground. And historically we mine lower and lower grades at deeper and deeper levels in the crust. Uh, and so uh, it reminds me a lot of what we heard, or I heard as an analyst and a pundit and a speaker and, and a writer in 2010, 2011 about peak oil. <laughs> yeah. Well, that didn't quite play out, did it? <laughs> you know, we're, we're producing uh, at least uh, uh, 
uh, a million more barrels of oil per year, per day, uh, on an annual year over year basis. Every year, demand in oil is somewhat about a percent and a half a year, and and we're meeting that demand. We're producing more oil uh, today than we did yesterday, and we'll produce more oil uh, a year from now than we're producing now because the world demands it. So uh, this idea of peak oil uh, and peak gold, peak oil was it, the concept was bastardized from what King Hubbard said in, in 1956 and 1970. He was talking about the decline of giant oil fields. And he accurately predicted the U.S. would uh, reach a peak in oil production in 1970. He made that prediction 14 years before it happened. But what's happened now, 47 years later in 2017, the U.S. producing more oil than it ever has. And why? because of a technological revolution. 70% of the oil that we know is in the ground uh, that has been discovered is left in place. Now we're developing technologies through uh, uh, horizontal drilling and fracking, both technologies which were invented in the late 1940s and 1950s uh, are now coming to bear uh, in the shale oil revolution and we're extracting oil from uh, low permeability formations that were once looked on not as reservoirs, but the source rocks. Uh, that's a bit of a rant, long-winded rant, but uh, uh, I don't buy the idea of peak, peak gold, peak oil, peak copper, peak anything. I'm a cornucopian in the world. Uh, we will find what we need uh, when we need it at an economic extraction level. Got to say, I like we'll find like substitutes for it. Got to say, I like that positive outlook, Mickey. It's, it's, it's well, I'm an eternal optimist. You have to be in my business where uh, the chances of success as exploration geologists are so low. And notice I said that in an optimistic manner. I did not say that the, the chances of failure are so high. That's Got the it. way a pessimist would look at it. I'm an optimist. A skeptical <laughs> optimist, though. Good man, I, I I like that. I, it it really shows you're truly a colorful <laughs> guy. Gotta love it. Um, well, I have a 365 a day a year suntan, so I'm colorful <laughs> because I live in the, in a high altitude in a in an arid climate in New Mexico. <laughs> Mickey, let me circle back around where you had mentioned um, silver and and how silver is a byproduct uh, to lead, zinc, uh, copper. Yeah. Um, how rare are primary silver miners? Uh, I don't know any uh, silver miners that do not uh, mine significant amounts of other metals. I've looked, I've tried to find silver, pure silver companies, even in junior resource space. Uh, you, uh, you can find silver deposits in the oxidized zone, uh, shallow, uh, where all the other metals have been leached out of the rock. Um, those sorts of deposits uh, existed a lot in the past during the gold and silver rushes of the 1800s, but uh, uh, we found most of those easily uh, discovered surface deposits. So uh, I don't really know any silver miners that, uh, that are not significant, significant lead, zinc, copper, or gold miners. Okay. It really is a byproduct and, or a, a co-product, uh, even though the revenues can be uh, very skewed to the silver side, but uh, you got to send your ores to a lead, zinc smelter or a copper smelter, or you pour Doré uh, at the mine uh, where gold is the uh, primary metal, or at least in terms of value. How big of an impact uh, would the supply of silver be if, if let's say, the lead, zinc, or, or copper mines uh, were to shut down or if their production starts to fall? Uh, how much so would that impact the silver prices and supply? Well, uh, significantly, because, uh, like I say, uh, uh, you got to go through the smelter, and the smelter uh, is wanting 
is designed to smelt lead or zinc and or zinc ores and or copper ores. Um, so if if the demand for those metals is lower, and certainly the demand for copper is never lower, much like oil, uh, the demand keeps going up. But lead and zinc, uh, the demand can go up and down yeah. uh, depending on the price. And increasingly, lead is recycled. Um, a significant part, and I think, uh, if memory serves, I'm pulling this out of the memory banks, and, I'm, and I may not be correct, but uh, uh, well over half of the lead use in the world now is, uh, uh, and it's mainly used for uh, for car batteries, or uh, is uh, is recycled lead. You know, yeah. there are primary lead mines in the world, uh, specifically uh, in the area near where I grew up in uh, the Ozarks of Missouri. Uh, world's largest lead mines there, and they have very few byproduct credits. Certainly, uh, very little silver. Okay, it's a hypothetical uh, question here. Um, let's say you mentioned lead and and car batteries, and and we are starting to move towards electric vehicles, where we're, we're starting to pick up on on nickel, cobalt, lithium ion, manganese, and and, and the like. Um, right. So let's say there is this shift, which is happening towards electric vehicles. Uh, perhaps we may need less lead for car batteries. And, and since the miners are going for less lead, might that impact the silver price being a, a secondary or a byproduct uh, for lead? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I don't have an answer. So I think I'll just say uh, I really don't know about that. Um, certainly the electric vehicle movement is going to have impacts. Uh, I'm not sure it's going to have impacts, uh, that big an impact on the traditional internal combustion engine. Uh, uh, it will not in the foreseeable future have any impact in the United States uh, because uh, we do not really have the clusters of population, uh, the uh, ability to get in your car and drive no more than 100 or 200 kilometers. And I stop, we're a big country and we like our gas guzzling SUVs and, uh, and three quarter ton pickups, but certainly the electrical vehicle movement is, is gonna be focused in China. Uh, it's going to make significant inroads, uh, partly because of regulation of banning of diesel vehicles in the European Union. Uh, uh, but we're not going to get rid of the demand for oil. We're not going to get rid of the demand for lead uh, in batteries. For instance, you build a, a solar, if you go solar with your house and solar electricity, you've got to store that solar energy at night. And how do you do that? You do that with lead acid batteries at this point uh, until vanadium redox batteries, but they have a very wide footprint. So, you know, this whole battery, metal battery uh, uh, revolution, electric vehicle uh, uh, demand and metal demand from that, I think is equivocal at best. It's certainly going to be a part of the economy going forward, but I, I would opine that the uh, projections are wildly exaggerated at this point. Mickey, last year, gold and, and silver had a, a fairly decent year, uh, 2017. Gold uh, was up about 13%, and, and I believe silver was up about 7%. Um, right now, both are down. In, in fact, gold is south of 1,300, which is something I think a lot of people didn't expect. Um, well, 27 as we speak. <laughs> yeah. Um, in your opinion, why do you think this this uh, lackluster impact of of the gold price? I mean, what what's what's going on with with gold? U.S. dollar strong. Mm. If you look back, uh, gold and thanks for the number down thirteen percent or up thirteen percent. Pardon me in twenty seventeen, mm. and the dollar was down. 11% in 2017. 
So the dollar started early 2017 and it hit a peak of 103 in the first couple of weeks of January. And by the end of the year, it was down to 92 and change. So that's uh, a little less than 11 percent. But uh, since uh, Trump was elected, uh, the uh, correlation, negative correlation of the U.S. dollar and gold uh, has gone in three parts. When he was elected till he was inaugurated, the correlation was something on the order of approaching uh, 0.85, something like that, negative 0.85, which for those that don't uh, have a base in statistics, uh, that's a very high number, 1.0 being a, a perfect one-to-one of correlation. Then from the day he was inaugurated until July 15th of last year, there was no correlation of the dollar and gold. On July 15th, something very important happened geopolitically, and that was the North Koreans launched a couple of missiles over Japan. Since that time, July 15th, a little bit more than a year, the correlation of gold and the U.S. dollar is something a negative 0.9. So basically, when the dollar goes up, gold goes down, and we've seen that it, this year, uh, you know, U.S. dollar was uh, uh, 89 or below 89. It went down in 88 and a half in sometime in April. And since then, it's been on this really big run. It was up to 95 and a half DXY last week. So a significant amount of the drop in the gold price, about half can be attributed to strength the U.S. dollar. Uh, uh, the other portion, I think, is seasonality of the gold price. This is the summer doldrums, and gold always goes down. This, Or not always, but about eight or nine out of every ten years, gold has a seasonal or, or yearly low during uh, from mid-June to, to usually mid-August, but it can go to uh, the Western world uh, or America's Labor Day in early September. And then we have the wedding and festival seasons in India, which increases demand, and we normal and everybody comes back to work. You know, half the financial world is off on vacation this week, and the other half's off on vacation next week. So, um, so I attribute the seasonality of the gold price to. So I look for a better gold price after Labor Day. Okay, yeah, because I'm. I mean, as I recall, um, the night of the election. Uh, Gold and silver were moving up uh, pretty well, and um, as soon as the the election was over and it was final that that Trump was going to be president, it just fell off the cliff and it's never really recovered. Well, it, you know, it did get up to. Uh, I mean, it was thirteen forty six here right. in mid April. Right. right. Uh, so it it goes up and it goes down. It was thirteen uh, fifty or so. Uh, uh, in the in the late summer and early fall of 2016, uh, you know it, uh, it 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 keeps getting to uh, 1350 and it bounces off yes. very strong resistance. Just as it's it's tested uh, uh, last year's low and this year's low about 1210. So uh, gold has increasingly been range bound. Uh, now that's a pretty big range, say 2010 to 1350, but it seems to be unable to break those uh, resistances uh, either on the upside or the downside. Uh, uh, we'll see, never quite know, but we're only really one geopolitically uh, ge geopolitical event away from, uh, from a stronger gold price safe haven demand insurance policy against financial calamity. Yeah, I hear you. Um, besides... Yeah, the other thing you got going on, at least, pardon me for interrupting, sure, would be sure. uh, in the U.S., uh, 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 real interest rates, and not only uh, the nominal Fed interest rate, but real interest rates are increasing, uh, and that's negative for gold because uh, uh, with uh, a few... A specific uh, uh, perturbations on that. No one pays interest on a gold loan of any significance. So, um, yeah. yeah, it's money. It is what it is. It maintains its purchasing power at all times. And uh, there's 
not a fiat currency in the world that does that. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you completely <laughs> on that. Um, I do understand that uh, when gold does have its dips, you are a buyer of physical gold. Um, but having said that, do you get frustrated at, at any point that it's just been going sideways for the past two or three years? I'm not really frustrated. I guess I get frustrated from the point of uh, my bailiwick and uh, my newsletter, a significant part of my newsletter. Uh, we pick junior resource stocks. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a low gold price or a, an unexciting uh, gold price or lack of volatility leads to low volumes on the Toronto Venture Exchange. So, uh, and low market capitalizations for juniors. So I can get frustrated by that, but, uh, yeah. uh, you know, I kind of roll with the flow on all this stuff, especially metals prices. And I look at low metals prices, uh, low gold prices as buying opportunities. I buy on dips. I'm a gold, a hoarder of gold. And I just keep adding to all the time. I don't sell my gold. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I won't be able to take it with me, but the people that survive, my lifetime are going to be uh, going to be well set up for their futures because they're going to own gold. And that's kind of the way I look at it. You know, uh, I'm a contrarian. I as a contrarian, you must have patience in the markets. Uh, I don't have patience uh, for a lot of things. I have patience for uh, for my significant other, my lovely girlfriend. And I have patience with uh, when I'm on the trout stream fishing. I have lots of patience there uh, and in the stock market. You need patience. Gold. Um, would you say we're we're in a bull market? And uh, going back to 2011, would you say that was a bubble? Uh, you'd have to argue it was a bubble. It went to nineteen hundred dollars. I was one of the one of the few voices of reason say it at the time. I said uh, in September, October of 2011, it won't get to two thousand. <laughs> it did not. Uh, uh, yeah, it went up. It went exponential. One thing you know, if you uh, if you've looked at the markets, if you have experience in the markets, uh, any financial instrument of any kind, uh, from stocks to currencies to to uh, uh, commodities that are turned into fiat currencies, uh, when they go exponential, they will go parabolic. So uh, you know. It, here's an exponential curve. Here's the parabolic top and down the slippery, slippery ski slope to the to the bottom. Uh, generally, if you are in a a real market that has any substance, the uh, level that it settles after it has gone parabolic is going to be higher than the level it started out before it went exponential. But this is the way markets work. And it's all about mass psychology uh, of of the people, of the markets. Uh, you know, the smart money gets in first. Uh, the uh, bubble happens. The dumb money comes in at the, at the top and uh, and all the sheep will follow and they get burned and the smart money uh, comes out ahead. It's the way markets work. Yeah. I'm, That's I, why you need to be a contrarian, as Rick Rule <laughs> says. You're either going to be a contrarian or you're going to be a victim, and that's exactly right. That's that's a good phrase, contrarian or victim. Okay, yeah, I I had to ask that question because um some people think that that 1900 uh, was fair market. Uh, some people think it it was a bubble. So I I, I like to hear uh, opinions on that. Yeah, I don't think it's going to 1900 anytime soon. You know, I wrote a piece. Uh, five weeks ago, and I'd been talking about it a month before that, uh, why gold ain't going anywhere anytime soon. And that was yeah. really focused on the upside of gold. And I didn't see it in the short term. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not saying it won't get to 1900 in my lifetime, but, uh, but I don't see it, uh, in the foreseeable future. You now it took, uh, it took what, uh, I'm trying to do the math in my head from 1980, uh, to uh, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, so 20 years more or less for it to to hit 850 again after the bubble in in 1980 when it went from 
around 300 bucks to 850 and immediately uh, came back down in a parabolic spike. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, maybe um, we're looking at uh, another 20 years before it hits 1900. I don't know. You know, uh, by the same token, uh, uh, the world's not was not awash in debt in 1980 the way it is right now. So the chances of financial collapse, I think, are are higher now than yeah. they certainly were back then. Yeah, again, I, I definitely would agree with that opinion. Um, for myself, um, actually, quite a few people we've uh, started to see gold um, as an investment slash insurance for exactly that reason that that you mentioned. So, being on insurance, I mean, uh, we're glad to see a, a, a steady, a low, steady gold price. Yeah, it gives you the ability to accumulate at low prices. You want to buy things, uh, all financial instruments that you that you speculate in and gold I do not consider an investment or a speculation it's a, it's an insurance policy a safe haven uh, yeah. but you in other markets you want to and this applies it's why I buy gold on dips you want to buy uh, anything you want to purchase it on sale you want it when it's unloved unwanted unknown or undervalued and I think uh, certainly uh, uh, now is a good time to accumulate some more gold. You know, I've never bought gold. I think the highest price I probably ever bought gold uh, was somewhere around thirteen hundred an ounce. So I wasn't buying at fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred, or nineteen hundred dollar gold. No way. You know, yeah. I started buying gold well in nineteen seventy nine when it was around three hundred an ounce, and I was buying at the top of the market. But I wanted gold at the time. So, uh, yeah. long history with gold here. <laughs> Nikki, you got some great advice. I, I'm, I'm going to stick with what you're <laughs> I don't saying. Know. It, but, I can't, I'm not a certified financial advisor, so I, I don't lend investment advice. All I do is tell people what I do. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, but having said that, um, before we wrap up, could you share with our listeners um, where they can find more of your work and, and your articles and opinions? Okay. Well, uh, I am not shy of having an opinion, as uh, Jim Rohn says, and, and he's an American sports pundit. Uh, have a take and don't suck when you come on his radio show. So, uh, uh, in other words, uh, have an opinion and have the uh, wherewithal to express it succinctly. Uh, uh, but uh, you can find me at mercenarygeologist.com. Uh, I run a free subscri subscription newsletter. All you have to do is go to the website below my mugshot, click on the on the link, and uh, and sign up. You got to give us uh, a name and an email. You can fake your name, but you got to give us a real email, and that allows you to get my stock picks, and that's part of the value uh, offered to free subscribers. If you want my stock picks, and we have been very successful uh, in the junior resource sector picking stocks, uh, you need to be an email subscriber. Uh, we have a very boisterous uh, Twitter feed, 53,000 Twitter followers, very active on Twitter, at Mercenary Geo. And, uh, and the business is now uh, 10 years old, and it's been very successful, and uh, uh, I, I hope I'm around to continue another 10 or 20 years. Mickey, we appreciate your time. And, and yeah, we, we hope we can uh, do this again. And we wish you all the best. Man, I don't think I riled up too many silver bugs today. I've been known to do that in the past, but because uh, I'm not a silver bug. I'm, I'm part of the customer service team. So if anybody was riled up, I will be probably answering your phone call or email. <laughs> That was Mickey Falk, the mercenary geologist. For more of his insights on precious metals and the resource sector, please visit his website, www.mercenarygeologist.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on our new content.